Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Deep Learning Systems Aggression Implementation. My name is Tianxi Chen. You can call me TQ. Uh, it's great to bring this class with SQL together to everybody, and hopefully we enjoy the journey of building our Deep Learning frameworks from scratch. So today we're going to cover a very important part of our entire lecture sequences. We're going to tell you a bit about how do we do automatic differentiation. So first of all, let's start to recap on you know what why do we need to do automatic differentiation and the different different differentiation methods. Then the second part of lecture, we're going to cover a main method called reverse mode automatic differentiation that is being used in modern deep learning frameworks. So let's start with the first part. So how does automatic differentiation fit into the general machine learning workflow? If we recall a previous two classes. We have talked about you know, the basic elements of machine learning. When you think about the machine learning aggression, usually you want to think about them in a few perspectives. First of all, we are thinking of when you think about the hypothesis class, that is for a given input x, how do you get predictions for the given input? For normal cases, in the last few lectures, we talk about multi-layer perception and the single layer perception aggressions. In the following lecture, we're going to talk about different hypothesis class, like convolution neural networks transformers and generative neural networks that give us, you know, for the given input that transform the given input to the prediction. Of course, for a given, given hypothesis class, still, there are still several things that are um, being undetermined. Specifically, each of hypothesis will be parameterized by a set of parameters, theta, and we will need to learn a good theta from training data set. So the second element, in machine learning, usually, that you will see, is a loss function. The loss function defines for a given hypothesis class and uh, uh, parameter theta how good our prediction is. And usually, we measure it on in terms of you know, training data set. So we will try to effectively uh, try to find a set of theta that minimizes the loss function on a training data set. And then we will use that learned parameter theta to run prediction on future data set we see. So the loss function is the element that measures how good we are. Finally, for a given loss function, we will still need to be able to find a good theta that minimizes that loss function. That's where the third perspective comes in, which is the optimization method. Most of the machine learning uh, optimization aggression actually in terms of deep learning usually takes this form of stochastic gradient optimization. So effectively, we will try to take loss function and try to compute a gradient of a loss function with respect to the parameter theta. And that gradient function is a direction that helps us to, you know, uh, usually it it's increases the, the loss function by a tiny bit. And our goal is to decrease it, right? So you are going to take a negative gradient direction in a small step. And uh, most of the method we use are usually also called stochastic gradient method. That means that we are not trying to take computer gradient over the entire data set. Instead, we'll try to take a mini batch of samples from the data set, and then we'll try to directly take a small step towards the gradient computed on that mini batch. And this is usually called stochastic gradient method. Of course, depending on the particular update aggression, the, the update rule can change. Um, in this particular case, we are trying to show a basic form of stochastic gradient descent. And in the future lectures, we'll also talk about other forms update, including things like momentum-based method and uh, adaptive gradient method. But in all those cases, the key and the, the fundamental problem that we need to solve here is how do we compute this gradient of uh, of loss function with respect to theta. And that is the center of almost all the machine learning, machine learning aggressions that, uh, that we use to learn uh, for a given data set. And of course, there are different ways for us to compute this gradient. Um, when I was an undergraduate student working on machine learning, the basic skill that we need to learn is how do you manually derive the gradient for a given loss function. Uh, luckily today, you don't no longer have to because there are a lot of tools that help you to do that automatically. And for to be honest, for the given complexity of, of models that we're dealing with today, it's almost infeasible to derive the gradient 
by hand. So today our goal is trying to talk about some of the methods that help us to get to those gradient in a more automatic fashion or pragmatic fashion. To begin with, let's start to think about how what is the easiest way to compute a gradient. And when we think about gradient computations, the first thing that we might not think about is how do we do that starting from a definition of gradient. If you recall your calculus class, you might remember that a partial differentiation of a function, so in this case, this function f, um, we are using f to denote the loss function in here. And we're, inter we're interested in partial derivatives with respect to one over parameters, right? So a gradient of function theta effectively can be, uh, can be defined as partial derivatives theta 0, theta 1, f theta partial theta 1, f theta, partial theta n, f theta, right? So, so effectively, if we are able to compute the partial derivative of a function with respect to a single parameter axis, then we will be able to compute the entire gradient. So let's start by remembering our calculus class and trying to find what is the definition of partial gradient. So, this is defined as follows. Right? So for a given theta, what we're going to do is we're trying to take a small step at the i-th direction of, of my parameter space. So in here, e of i is a unidirectional vector that's 0 everywhere and 1 in 1 places. And this is the i-th element in here. So effectively, uh, e of i is a unidirectional vector that, that points to you know, that particular parameter dimension. And we're trying to take a small step along that dimension. Right? And we're, we're trying to, then we'll compute the difference between f theta plus epsilon e of i subtracting f of theta. Okay? Then we're going to divide it by the step size we're taking. So the partial derivative is defined by taking the limit of this epsilon to 0 and, and the, you know, compute the difference and divide it by the epsilon. Okay, so this is the formula that operationable. Right? So what we can do act, act, actually is we can try to use this formula to compute the gradient numerically. So you know we will be able to pick a theta i, pick pick e i and epsilon, compute f theta plus e i and subtracting that by f theta. Okay, and uh, divide it by epsilon. And if you pick a small enough epsilon. That's going to approximately gives you the gradient. So this is also called numerical differentiation method because we are trying to effectively do it by numerically, right? Uh, by definition. In practice, we really want to approximate gradient in this way. There's a more accurate formula uh, shown on the second second part. So instead of trying to uh, subtracting f theta plus epsilon e i subtracting f of theta, we are subtracting f theta minus epsilon e of i, and this usually gives you a more accurate uh, estimation. To see why this is the case, recall that in your calculus class, you will know that f of theta plus theta can be written as f of theta um, plus the first order gradient, right? So in this case, let, let's try to do a one-dimensional version so it's easier, and plus the 201 f second order gradient delta squared plus O of delta uh, quadratic. Right. So if we plug in delta equals uh, epsilon e of i and delta equals epsilon minus e of i, what we'll find is that this formula is going to give us effectively, you know, uh, it's going to have the second term in here canceled out because regardless whether whether or not you plug in, you plug in you know, positive epsilon e of i or minus um, epsilon e of i, this second order term is always going to be the same. As a result, if I'm going to use this to approximate my gradient, you will find that you know the the error, the order of error is in the order of you know o of epsilon squared. While if you use this formula to approximate a gradient, you will get a higher order error term of O of epsilon, 
So usually, if you really want to do numerical computations of gradient, you want to take the second method that gives you a high, higher, uh, more accurate estimation of the gradient numerically. So this is the method that actually you know, we can use to compute a gradient, but it is not a method that commonly used in practice. The reason is that, you know, because in a lot of cases, uh, it will suffer from a numerical error. Because you know, in this case, we really need epsilon to be small to compute the compute a gradient. The second reason is that remember, for each of the i in here, we kind of need to run run the computation of f theta plus epsilon i each of for each of the i x in here, right? So if you have n parameters, effectively we need to run two times n evaluation of f. And remember, in our neural network, that means that I want to run two times n forward evaluations of my function in order to really get a gradient, which is really costly. So usually this is not a formula that's being used in practice because it suffers from the error for error and less efficient compare, compute. However, it is a formula that's still being very widely used actually in, in practice for other purposes. The reason that why we want to use this formula is because it's really straightforward to compute, right? So it's really easy to get it right. While if you want to learn other automatic penetration methods, while it's okay to still understand everything, you might implement it in some way, you know, and we want to verify that whether or not we implement it correctly. So numerical differentiation is commonly used to uh, do gradient checking, or so it's being used to check if we have an automatic differentiation method that computes a gradient. We want to check whether our implementation is correct. Okay. However, in practice, if you want to do that for each of the theta i's, the numerical gradient computation can still be very costly if we have a lot of input parameters. So instead, we'll use another form that is um, a bit generalized from the numerical um, gradient, gradient computations um, that help us to check the gradient correctness. So the idea is that instead of trying to pick e of i, we're going to pick a delta function a data, data vector, and this vector, you can pick it randomly from the unit board in here. And by the same derivation, you'll find that this formula holds okay, for, for any of the data in here. And so in order to check the gradient, what I will do is I will first plug in the gradient by uh, my auto gradient tool, right? So my auto gradient tool will be able to supply the gradient on the left hand side, I'm going to pick a data function, uh, a data vector in here, and I'm going to compute f epsilon, uh, f theta plus epsilon data and f theta minus epsilon data, and I compute the right hand side of the formula. I'm going to check if they are close to each other. Okay? So we can do that for a few thetas, randomly sample from Uniboy, and that, that sometimes usually sufficient to cover all those gradient directions, and it's being a very good test case for us to check you know, whether our implementation of automatic differentiation is correct. And you want to really learn this formula because you are going to use it also in your homework so that you, before you really submit your homework solutions, you can use this method to check whether or not my gradient computation is correct. And this is also a method being used by most of the deep learning frameworks to check their implementation of automatic differentiation. Okay. So that's numerical gradient, uh, numerical gradient and numerical gradient checking. Although it's not something that we widely use in practice, it's a very useful tool for us to confirm the correctness of our implementation of gradient computation. So let's move on to a second kind of uh, way to compute a gradient. And this is kind of a typical way that I will do before automatic differentiation is becoming popular. So if actually what we want to do is we want to do it by hand. So how do we do it by hand? We're going to go and write down the formula of this uh, f function. And I'm going to try to derive you know, symbolically what the gradient function looks like. And of course, in order to do that, I need to apply several gradient derivation rules, right? So including this additional rule that derives you know, what is the gradient when you want to compute a gradient of sum of two functions what is the a gradient of multiplications of two functions, and the train rule, what is the gradient when you compose function together. So we're going to apply those rules to derive our gradient. Of course, it's really hard to do that manually for 
you know, uh, complicated model. So we're going to do that for a simple case. And let's assume that we're only going to do that for a product of several theta. So in here, f of theta equals theta one times theta two times theta three and times theta n. Okay. And we're interested in partial derivatives with respect to case uh, case parameter here, theta k. Okay. So in order to do that, we what you find is you want to apply the product rule uh, in here. And uh, actually it's actually it's not that, yeah, so so it's not even product. You can directly try to derive the partial derivative here. And if you look at you know, my result is theta one times theta two times theta n. And what is the gradient? If we want to take respect, take gradient with respect to theta two, the gradient is going to be theta one times theta three times theta m, okay? So effectively, we want to write it out in a formula, you'll find that the gradient with respect to theta k is gonna be the product of all the parameters except theta k. Okay, so seems that for this particular function, it's really easy for us to go and manually derive the gradient. Right? So that is also, um, for a lot of past machine learning works, that's how many people derive their update rule. Not necessarily a gradient, but in a similar fashion, you want to derive you know, what is the local optimized maxima holding other things to constant. And, and you know, this kind of gradient derivation is quite common. However, if you will start to look at this formula and if you want to go and derive, directly apply this formula to compute our gradient, you still find there are several issues in here. In order to compute each of the partial gradient, f theta, uh, re, re, with respect to a partial theta k, you'll find that I will need to do n minus two multiplications. And I need to do that for each of the parameters. That means that I need to do, I need to do n times n minus two, which is a quadratic number of multiplications with, with respect to the input parameters. However, if you want to do that smartly, you'll find out that if, in order to compute the partial gradient, with respect to all the theta, I only need to do about n times multiplications instead. The reason why this you know, manual symbolic derivation will cause so many duplicate computations is because there are some computations that can be reused among those uh, partial derivatives that are not being reused by simply you know, writing down this partial symbolic differentiation formula. Okay? So I want everybody to keep that in mind, and you want to keep that question on your hand, we're also going to talk about automatic differentiation methods um, in, the, in the next few slides. And you want to ask what is the relation between this symbolic differentiation and the forward and backward uh, automatic differentiation? That is actually a relation, and uh, um, you know, in certain cases, you can you can you can derive the automatic differentiation method by viewing them as a symbolic differentiation plus some form of simplification. Okay, so keep that in mind. And now let's move on to the first automatic differentiation method. But before we do that, let's start to introduce some basic tools that we're gonna use in this class. And if you have used uh, some of different inferments before, you have, might have already heard a term called computational graph. So computational graph is in the center of almost all the machine learning frameworks, and it's also kind of an important tool for us to go and derive automatic differentiation methods. So for a computational graph, effectively, it's a, it's a direct, a cyclic graph that is used to represent the computation that is being carried out for a certain function. For example, this is a computational graph that represents this particular computation. Of course, for a single computation, there could be different ways of computational graph because, you know, if you want to compute the, the uh, say, multiply of three elements, A, B, and C, you can multiply A and B together, then multiply that by C, or you can multiply B and C together. That will correspond to two computational graphs. So computational graph also specifies a bit about, you know, the order of execution in certain sense. Each of the nodes in a computational graph represents an intermediate computation. For example, this particular node represents this log computations that takes in the value of vr, v1, and outputs 
value v3 that's getting getting input into another computation v6. So each one node represents the intermediate value in the computation, and the edge represents the input output relations among those computations. Uh, so each of the computation graph computation node will have input edges that represent input onto them, and their output edges represents you know where their output goes into. So let's walk through this combination graph on the left hand side and uh, try to manually evaluate this combination graph. We're going to do this because it's going to be helpful for our future cases on deriving automatic differentiation. So on this particular case, uh, let's assume that I want to, I'm interested in f of 2 and 5. Okay? And the way that we're going to evaluate the combination graph is I'm going to place Two in here, and five in here, and then I'm going to, you know, walk this graph in this topological order. So I'm first, need to look at v1. We know that v1 equals x in here, so v1 equals two. And then I'm going to look at v2, and v2 equals five. Okay. Then I'm going to look at v3. In this case, v3 takes v1 as input, and computes the logarithm of the result. And you know, log of two in here. This this number, you know, I I, I do not try to compute it by by, by hand, but you, know, you can always open up a Python or other tools to compute it. And then v4 equals v1 multiply v2. So in this case, v4 equals 10. Then v5 is a sine of v2, and sine of 5 equals this number. v6 is the addition of v3 and v4. That gives us a result. And finally, v7 is v6 subtracting v5, so that's my final result. Finally, I'm getting the result of y here. Okay? So it might be a good, good thing if you have a paper on hand and trying to do it and follow this computational graph chase to kind of get a sense of you know, what it takes to evaluate the computational graph. So for a computational graph, what you can do is you can put your value on the input side. And then you're going to walk the combination graph in topological order. For each of the nodes, you will try to take the input value, which I already computed, because we are walking this in topological order. Then we're going to compute the value, output value of that particular node. And then after you traverse the entire graph, you will be able to get output values on the very end. So this is a tool being used by most of the deep learning frameworks to represent computations. And it's also a very useful tool to derive automatic differentiation. Okay, so now we are ready to introduce our first automatic differentiation method. And this method is called forward mode automatic differentiation. So let's assume that we're interested in the partial derivatives of the intermediate value um, with respect to the first input, in this case, x1. Okay? And we're going to recursively derive this value uh, for, for each of the computational graph nodes. That's the name hints, we want to derive it from a very beginning. So first of all, um, let's try to see what is v1 dot in here. And by definition, we know that we are interested v1 dot equals partial v1, partial x1. In this case, we know that v1 equals x1. Right? So, so v1 dot effectively equals in here equals one. So that's what I want to derive from the beginning because you know uh, it's really easy to get those answers, at least for the, for the input parameter. Similarly, v2, we know v2 equals x2, so I have nothing to do with x1. Right? So, so in this case, v2 dot equals 0. Okay. Now let's look at v3 dot. We know that v3 dot equals partial v3, partial x1. While v3 is a function of v1, right? so it also equals partial log of v1 partial x1, and by taking train rule, this will equal v1 over 1 times partial v1 partial x1. Okay? And then you will find that this, this gradient value will take two parts. Right? The first part is actually the partial derivative of v3 with respect to v1, and the second part equals v1 dot. By definition. So effectively, my v3 dot equals v1 dot divided by v1 in here. And 
if you look at v1 dot, the value is 1, v1's value is 2, so the v3 dot equals 0 0.5. Okay? Now let's look at v4. Similarly, we can apply the multiplication rule in here, right? So we know that v4 equals v1 times v2, so partial, partial x1, v1 times v2. By applying multiplication rule, we know that it equals partial v1, partial x1, times v2, plus partial v2, partial x1, times v1, okay? And this is v1 dot, and this is v2 dot. Okay, so that's why we are getting this formula in here. And if we look up the v1, v2 values on the left hand side, and v1 dot, v2 dot value here, we'll get uh, the partial derivative of v4 dot equals 5. Similarly, for v5, the sine, right? So what we're going to do is you know, the the partial derivative of sine is cosine function, that's equals v2 dot times cosine v2, in this case 0, and uh, v6 and v7 can be derived in the same way. So I would highly encourage everybody to you know, open up a pen and paper and try to follow these derivations because it gives you a much better sense of what's going on in this forward mode automatic differentiation. And finally, you can find that after we walk through each of a computational graph node, in the end, we're going to get v7 dot, right? The, the partial derivative of a final node with respect to the first input. And that is a value that uh, we get in here. So you can find that, you know, the, why we are calling it forward mode automatic differentiation. Right? So the idea is that for each of a step, we're trying to, starting from the beginning, because, you know, for the parameters, it's really easy to get those gradient. If the parameter equals the input parameter that we want to take differentiation with respect to, then the value equals one. Otherwise, the value equals zero, right? Then for each of the intermediate computational graph node, we're trying to reduce the gradient values to the partial derivatives of that node with respect to its input and the forward mode automatic differentiation value of its input. Right, so, so each of the steps we are doing this recursive computations, as long as I know the v dot, vi dot of my input parameters, in, input nodes, then I will be able to compute the vi dot of this current node, and, and so on. So after you walk through the entire computational graph, you will get the vi dot for all the nodes. And, and in this case, you can also find the computational graph comes in very handy. Right? So you can imagine that, you know, um, how you would want to implement this aggregation using a programming language like Python. Okay, so this forward mode AD, on the other hand, you'll find that the forward mode AD still comes with a bit of limitations. You want to compute the gradient for like a neural network model. Specifically, um, if you have a function that takes n inputs and k outputs, a forward mode AD is really good if n is small and k is large, because it allows us to be able to compute the gradient values with respect to you know, one of the inputs in one pass. So if n is small, but I have a lot of outputs in my, in my function, then I will be able to run one pass uh, to be able to get all the gradient of output with respect to that particular input. However, if we have n input parameters, in order to get a gradient, we will need to run n forward AD passes to get a gradient with respect to each of the input. Okay? And in a, in a deep learning case, we mostly care about a one output scalars, right? So we are interested in a scalar output where the loss function is scalar in here, and a lot of input parameters. So we kind of need a different method to, in order to solve the, this kind of problem differently. And this is a method that we'll talk about in the second part of today's lecture. It's called reverse mode automatic differentiation. Okay. So let's start to derive the reverse mode automatic differentiation. And you know, if you have a 
piece of pen, paper by your hand, or if you can get the slides on your side, I would highly recommend you to follow this slide of derivations. We're going to derive each step by step. And trying to ask yourself, you know, can you really confirm that it is the case in each step of derivations? And this is going to be the majority of content actually for today's lecture. Okay. So in order to compute the gradient of a single scalar output value with respect to a lot of inputs, uh, we're going to define a, sick, a different term called adjointing in here. Where the adjoint chain is defined as the partial derivative with, from the output scalar with respect to each of the intermediate value nodes here. Just like forward model AD, we will be able to derive it in a more recursive fashion. In this case, as the name hints, we want to derive it from the end of the combination graph as opposed to the beginning, because the way that adjoint is being defined. Okay? So let's start from the end. Let, let's ask, you know, what is edge on V7? In this case, by definition, edge on V7 is partial Y, partial V7. And we know that Y is V7. So we, you can find that, yeah, the first step is really easy. The partial derivative, the edge on value is one in this case, okay? Now we have derived partial, um, the edge on value of V7. Let's look at edge on value of V6. And we're interested in partial y, partial v6. How do we do that? We know that you know uh, v6, v, v7 is function of v6, right? So, so effectively, we can apply train rule in here, and we know that it will equal partial y, partial v7, and then partial v7, partial v6. Okay. And if you look at the first part, this is the edge on value of V7. The second part is a partial derivative of V7 with respect to V6. In this case, because V7 equals V6 subtracting V5, that partial derivative is one. So I will be able to derive V6. So far, so good. Let's take a look at V5. The derivative of V5 is quite similar because the relation of V5 and V6 with respect to V7 is similar, except that the partial derivative of v, v, V7 with respect to V5 is negative one in here. Okay. And now um, let's take like V4. In this case, it's uh, we can do it in a similar fashion as well, because you now V6 is a function of V4 and y is a function of v6. So partial y, partial v4 can be written as partial y, partial v6, because v6 is the function of v4. y apply partial v6, partial v4 in here. And the first part is edge on the value of v6. Second part is the edge on the is a partial derivative of v6 with respect to v4. In this case, it equals one. Okay, so derivation of v7 adjoint can be done in a similar fashion. This becomes slightly more interesting if you look at the part the edge on value of v2. And here, you know, v2 is being used by both v4 and v5. Okay, so in order to compute the edge on value of, of, of V2, namely partial Y, partial V2, we want to be able to take this both pathways into consideration. So we want to, so it will equal uh, V5 edge on times the partial derivative of V5 with, with respect to V2. Intuitively, it's more like a gradient being passed from this pathway. And V4 edge on times partial V4 um, partial v2, the gradient being passed back from this pathway. We're going to make a more detailed derivation, a formal derivation in the next slide about why, why it's the case. Okay? And similarly for v1, uh, you, you, it's also being used in two pathways. You can find that there are you know, adjoint values and partial derivatives from two pathways being passed back. So we're going to do a slightly more formal derivation of the two pathway cases in the next slide, but let's 
first take a look at this particular uh, at, at this particular reverse mode AD trace in here. Right? We're gonna find that you know to summarize the the idea is that by defining edge on values, we'll be able to recursively derive the edge on value of each of a computational graph node from the very end. So we we start from V7, which where the edge on value is trivial because you know the, the edge on value equals one. And then for each of the node, we will be able to derive the edge on values from the edge on value of its next node, right? Or of the node that takes this particular node as input, and partial derivatives of this output node with respect to the input node. And after we get the edge on value of v1, by definition, the edge on value of v1 is partial uh, y, partial x1, right? And edge on value of v2 is partial y, partial x2. And if you put it together, this effectively equals the gradient of f with, with respect to all the input x parameters. Okay. So that's our gradient. Right? So reverse mode AD really allows us to be able to compute the gradient of the scalar function with respect to all the input values in a single backward uh, pass. Okay, so we have to talk about the reverse mode automatic differentiation. Now let's let's take a closer look at the multi pass case. We just gloss over of you know uh, what happens in the multi pass case and why do you want to add those partial joint together. Um, if you, you know, if others tell you like, hey, I learned all of my differentiation, you certainly want to also question with this multi pathway case on how you exactly derive uh, this case where the single input value is being used by multiple output values and how do you pass edge on value. So let's take this example where V1 is being used by both V2 and V3, okay? So in this particular case, we can actually write the output function y as a function of v2 and v3. On the other hand, we also know that v2 and v3, both of them are also function of v1. Okay? So in order to take partial derivatives of partial y, partial v1, what we're gonna do is we're going to take, so we, we, we will need to take partial derivatives of f with respect to each of these input value, v2 and v3. So first of all, we're gonna take the partial derivative of um, with respect to v2, holding v3 as a constant, and multiply that by partial v2, partial v1 here. Then we are going to take the partial derivative value, take, holding v2 as a constant, and then multiply that by partial v3, partial v1. And finally, you know, we need to add them together to get the final partial derivative. So this is uh, the, the formal derivation, and the, this is, the, so this, this is kind of like a, um, the partial derivative computation rule that you learn in your calculus. So as a result, the final edge on value of v1 will become the sum of all those edge on values of this output times the partial derivatives of the particular output with, with respect to that input node v1. So in this case, actually, it's, it might be helpful to also define a notation called partial adjoint of that particular edge. So let's say the partial adjoint of I2J here is defined as the adjoint value of output node J and the partial derivatives of the particular output with respect to that input node I. So effectively, while defining partial adjoint as values attached to each of these computational graph edges, where the edge on value is attached to each of a conventional graph node. And that's a very natural relation here. So we'll be able to compute edge on V1 by summing the partial edge on of V1 to V2, to V2 and partial edge on of 1 to 3 together. And this notation is helpful for us to you know, formally write down the automatic differentiation aggregation and, and use it in our implementation. Okay, so, so far we have derived automatic differentiation by hand. You can see that with a computational graph and the definition of adjoint, we will be able to recursively derive the intermediate gradient 
in a in a in a recursive manner by backward traversing a computational graph. Now let's start to think about how we are going to implement that aggregation uh, using C uh, Python code or using um, any of the languages that you like. So the implementation of aggregation well, is going to look like this. This is one instance of implementation. Of course, there are other ways to implement it, but this is one way. So let's walk through this particular implementation. And you know, you want to try to pay attention carefully because this is also what we are going to implement as the first part of our homework. As a matter of fact, it's going to be the foundation of everything we do in this class. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to create a dictionary that maps each of a conventional graph node to a list of partial adjoints. So in this case, I'm not trying to map the node to an adjoint, but I'm going to map it to a list of partial adjoints so that we can partially accumulate the partial adjoint on a fly um, and uh, in, in, during our computation. Okay. So we know that output node adjoint is one um, from our previous derivations. Then what we can do is we can reversely transverse my computational graph. For each of the node i, the first thing I'm going to do, we know that node to grad contains a list of partial edges. So we're going to sum it together to get my edge. On. Once, my, once I get the edge on value of vi, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute a partial adjoint for each of the inputs to i. So for each of the k node from the input list of this particular competition graph node, we're going to compute partial adjoint of vk to i by computing this formula. Right? So we can it equals vi times uh, partial vi partial vk. Then we're going to append this partial adjoint to node to grad k uh, values, and uh, and then we're going to repeat this loop in here. Remember that we are taking these iterations in a reverse topological order. That means that after we start to get to node i, we have already visited all the nodes that takes i as an input. That means that the partial adjoint list is already being populated that contains all the partial adjoint values. That allows us to sum, sum everything together in here. Right? And finally, after we run everything, we'll be able to get the uh, adjoint of input, and we can return that. Uh, to my to my um, to the to the to the outside. Okay, so this is an implementation of reverse mode automatic differentiation. Next, what I'm going to tell you is that you know, I'm going to tell you a variant of this implementation. Before I'm going to do that, I would like everybody to pause a bit and think about how you might want to implement this action, and specifically, what kind of data structure you want to use to represent. VI and the VI to J partial edge on here. A natural answer that one can come up with in this case is I'm just going to use the uh, a, a, a multi-dimensional array right, to store the, the particular computed result in here, which is a very valid answer. However, in practice, we are not actually doing that. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to run this same algorithm. But we're going to, instead of computing the actual concrete values of each partial edge on i to j and partial edge on vi, we're going to construct a computational graph. Uh, well, if you don't get what I mean, uh, you will get it once we walk through this example. So here is the computational graph that we're going to take the uh, automatic differentiation with respect to. I'm going to run and the code on the left hand side. And this particular computation graph expresses the function exponential of v2, and this is the plus, plus, sorry, this particular function is exponential of v1 plus 1 times exponential of v1 in here, right? So, so, and in order to compute the reverse mode automatic differentiation, that's going to run this aggression. It's the first step. 
We're going to compute the path to adjoint where i equals 4. So I'm going to compute the adjoint value of v4. In this case, we know that v4 adjoint value is 1. But instead of trying to directly create an array saying that you know, v4 value is equals 1, I'm going to create a computational graph node in here. And in this case, id is an identity function, so which means that it's just going to take its input and output it. So in this case, v4 actually directly equals 1. So I'm, I'm annotating v4 bar here so that you can understand that, hey, this is the corresponding node that corresponds to the adjoint value of v4. As the next step, we are going to come to i equals 3. And, uh, and in this case, um, and, and, and in this case, I'm uh, sorry. So in the next step, actually, we are going to first get to i equals 4, but I want to compute uh, the inner loop. I right? want to iterate over all the inputs. In this case, input of v4 is 2 and 3. I need to compute the partial adjoint values. In this case, we know that partial adjoint value of v224 equals v4's adjoint times partial v4, partial v2. In this case, we know that v4 equals v2 times v3. So partial v4, partial v2 equals v4 bar times v3 in here, right? So we know that this value of partial adjoint value of v224 equals v4 bar times v3. Instead of creating an array that corresponds to that value, we are creating a computational graph node that represents that computation. Right? So in this case, it represents a computation saying that v224 equals uh, v4 partial adjoint times v3. Similarly, uh, the partial adjoint of v3, in this case, because v3 only have one output, so the partial adjoint actually equals adjoint value. It equals v2 times v4 bar, because again, v4 equals v2 times v3, so the partial adjoint value of v3 equals v2 times v4. Okay, so that's the second step. Uh, that's when i equals 4, we're going to compute those partial adjoint values. Now moving next to i equals uh, 3, in this case, uh, the v3 only have one input node, which is v2, and right? this addition function. So the partial adjoint value of v223 exactly equals v3. That's why we're placing an identity function in here. Only next. So this is the part that becomes slightly more interesting. Right? This is the multi pathway case, where v2 is being used by both v4 and v3. So so when we are getting to this particular iterations, we need to sum the list in here. And this list is already being populated when we iterate over v4 and v3, and it contains v223 and v, uh, v224 in here. Right? So the, what, after we run this step, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new node that corresponds to v4, uh, v2's adjoint, and it's going to add this node and this node together. That gives the adjoint. Finally, we want to compute the partial adjoint of v1 to 2. And in this case, we know that um, partial adjoint of um, v1 to 2, or in this case, because v1 is only being used by, by one place, is equals v2 bar times partial v2, partial v1. And because v2 equals exponential v1, what is the gradient of exponential function? It's a value of itself. Right? So it equals v2 bar times exponential of v1. And we also know that exponential v1 exactly equals this value in here. Right? So as a result, the v1 bar can be expressed as v2 times v2 bar in here. We're kind of saving all of the additional exponential computations by 
creating this without instead of creating another exponential function. Okay, so that's how we are going to that's how we run this reverse mode AD computations. And you can find that in the end, unlike the case when we are deriving it by hand, where we are writing down the concrete values of each of the computations, we are creating this computational graph. It's another computational graph right? uh, that extends the original computational graph. And this new computational graph help us not only contains the forward computation that compute each of the intermediate values, but also contains the gradient computation that contains that computes the edge of value here. One amazing part of, about this computational graph is unlike the manual derivation case where you know each of the derivation you are we can only do it for one specific instance of you know x equals two and x one equals two and x five x two equals five. In this case, I can supply any v1 values here. For example, I can supply v1 equals zero in here, run through this computational graph, and I will be able to get the edge on the value of v1 when v1 equals zero. If I supply v1 equals two here, run this computational graph, I will be able to get the edge on the value of v1 uh, when, when v1 equals two. So this particular computational graph can be reused for different kind of input values. And in, in, without having to you know, rerun the automatic differentiation derivations from scratch. So this is just like a, a few slight interesting advantages that uh, the reverse mode AD aggression by extending computational graph will bring you. And this is also the aggression that most of the different frameworks nowadays uses. In the last lecture, we also talk about that propagation. So one of the questions you might have in mind is, what is the difference between the reverse mode AD that we just talked about in this lecture versus the backpropagation that we did in the past few lectures? So roughly, they can be summarized in, the, in this slide. When we're doing backpropagation, we are constructing a computational graph, and we'll, we will run the computations forward to get the values. And then when we're interested in gradient, we directly try to run backward operations on the same graph in here. As a result, um, effectively, you know, we are, we are trying to run back reversely to reverse the original computational graph. There's no extra computational graph node being created during the backward computations. Actually, this backpropagation method was the method that Gavin Hinton and Alice originally used. And it's being used in first generation different frameworks, namely Cafe and CUDA CompNet, when the Alexei won the ImageNet challenge and the image deep learning really takes off. Uh, Backpropagation was the aggregation that that's primarily used in a lot of the machine learning frameworks, except for one, which is Ciano, which kind of pioneers this uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation idea through combinational. So, um, in the second generation, which when TensorFlow and PyTorch came out, actually the reverse mode AD by extending computational graph approach takes over. And nowadays, most of the deep learning frameworks do not leverage backpropagation aggregation that try to directly do back, backward operation in place, the original computational graph. Instead, they will always try to construct this new extra gradient part of a computation that correspond to the edge on computation. And I will, like, I will only pause here a bit and, uh, and let everybody think a bit of asking this question, why? Why does modern different frameworks leverage this reverse mode AD by extending combination graph? Yeah, there are several reasons behind this. Um, and both in terms of you know, computing gradient as well as how easy it is to optimize the computation. So first of all, we know that in certain cases, when we're working on machine learning, you might want to you know, do certain loss functions that relates to the gradient. For example, one of the typical loss functions that one might ask is, I'm interested in minimizing v1 bar square in here, okay? So in, in this case, what we're trying to do is we want to take, define a loss function, take a gradient, which is back to a particular input, 
And I want to be able to then take a gradient with respect to a function of that gradient value. So in this case, this is a function of a gradient value. In backpropagation, what is really hard to do that because the backpropagation only defines and it tells you how I'm going to do the gradient with respect to the input, right? So, so it's only going to tell you how do you do the gradient once, but what about gradient of gradient? In the reverse mode AD by extending computation graph, so if you take a close look on the right, you'll find that we are taking a computational graph and the result computation is another computational graph. So what we can do in here is we can just attach another node called you know square that effectively takes v1 bar square in here, which is a computational graph. Then we can go and apply the same automatic differentiation aggregation on this computational graph that will give you the gradient of gradient values with respect to v1. So in some sense, you are getting this you know, gradient of gradient for free by building this reverse mode AD by extending computational graph. And this is really cool. This is a really cool part of this reverse mode AD aggregation of computational graph. And you are going to do it on your homework as well. And the, the really exciting part is, you know, once you implement this automatic differentiation aggregation, you kind of get a gradient of a gradient for free. The second reason why we typically use this um, computational graph, uh, reverse mode AD by extending computational graph approach is that you'll find that output of a gradient graph is still a computational graph. Right? So in order to evaluate this computational graph, all I need to care about is I just need to run this graph forward. As a result, there's more opportunities to go and optimize these computations, for example. In this case, for example, I could fold these two nodes together and these two nodes together because they're identity functions. That will make the gradient computation asymmetric. It's no longer, there's no longer one-to-one -one correspondence from the forward computation to the gradient computations. But the gradient computation can become more efficient. So it also brings a lot more opportunities for underlying machine learning framework to do certain optimizations for the gradient computation. Okay, so up until now, this is the main thing that uh, we, we focus on this lecture. If you want to get one takeaway, it's a picture and you really want to understand, making sure you understand aggression. How do we get to this reverse mode AD by extending computation graph approaching here? So up until now, we've talked about the uh, automatic differentiation we're deriving then using Scala value. In practice, uh, when we're dealing with neural networks, all our intermediate values are multidimensional tensors. And actually, it's, it's not that hard to generalize our reverse mode AD onto multidimensional um, uh, arrays and tensors. The way do, we do that is we generalize the definition of edge. So for a matrix like Z, which is a two-dimensional matrix, or for, for a tensor value, we're going to define the edge join of that matrix or tensor by another matrix whose element, each of the elements correspond to the edge on value with respect to that particular element. Because the edge on value with, with respect to a single scalar is well defined, as a result, we will be able to use that to define edge on value of the tensor. Right? Then what we can do is we can use a scalar automatic differentiation rule to design to, to derive the automatic differentiation rules for these matrix computation and tensor computations. For example, for the forward evaluation, we know that zij equals sum over k xik times wkj. Then we will be able to derive the edge on the value for a particular element, the xik in here. And we know that particular xik is being used by a lot of z values, right? By, by a lot of zijs. So we want to be able to sum those edge on value and partial derivative together. And finally, we know that equals, you know, sum over j double kj times zij bar in here. After you derive it in a scalar form, you can write it back on the matrix form, and you will find that this relation holds where the edge on value of x equals edge on value of z times w transpose. And that is the common rule that we use to in neural network computations to derive the gradient of a linear layer.
like this. Okay, so you know the reverse mode AD on tensors can be generalized. As a result, you'll find that we are, you know, the implementation effectively remains the same in the four tensors and multi-dimensional arrays. We have already talked about the pros and cons and back, back prop and reverse mode AD and handling of gradient gradient as well. So finally, uh, this is a bonus slide. Um, what we have, we have talked about so far reverse mode AD on tensors, right? However, when we are going to write programs, sometimes, you know, not all intermediate values are tensors. Sometimes we might want to put tensors in a data structure or other forms. For example, you know, we could have, uh, we could have a dictionary where you know each of a value of of the dictionary corresponds to a tensor that we might want to take differentiation with respect to. We can actually generalize the definition of adjoint onto those data types and data structures. Um, of course, the definition you kind of need to generalize the definition. For example, in this case, for a dictionary, we can generalize it by. Uh, in this case, we want to make sure the dictionary is, the P itself is always not a tensor, so it's always a value that we can take differentiation with respect to. But its value can be tensors, so we can define the adjoint as a, another dictionary that contains the same set of keys, but the value corresponds to the corresponding adjoint value. Right? So for each of forward computations like dictionary lookup, we'll be able to define a backward computation or gradient computations that effectively construct another dictionary that contains the edge of value. So the key takeaway here is that for different data types, we, we will be able to define the edge on computations as long as we can have a, have a definition for its edge on value and the edge on propagation rule. The same, the same reverse mode automatic differentiation actually should work for those cases. This is kind of a more general case called differentiable programming that we are not going to cover in this lecture and the for this class as well. Uh, you know, if you are interested in this concept, you are more than welcome to go and search related literatures, literatures on differentiable programming. You will be able to find some of related material here. Uh, we may want to have support for certain type of data structure in our assignment zone. So specifically, we might want to add support for uh, tuple values. That means that we want to support for a, a, a value that contains, you know, tuple of multiple tensors, and we want to be able to define edge on for that particular tuple value. So that is that that will be part of our implementation of the homework. Okay. So thanks everybody for coming to today's lecture. In today's lecture, we learned about, you know, why do we want to do differentiations and the, a set of tools for us to be, be able to both check the gradient of automatic differentiation implementation, as well as implementing reverse mode AD that give us the gradient values of all the inputs in one backward pass. Finally, we also talk about how we can build this reverse mode AD aggression on by extending computational graph so that we can use the same tool to obtain gradient of gradient and getting a lot of benefit on low level optimizations. In the next lecture, we're gonna cover more of the implementation details on that you're going to use in your homework to implement the everything that we described in this lecture. That's the end of today's lecture. Thanks for coming, and I will see you in next lecture.